Okay, so thank you for joining us today and welcome to the quarterly membership meeting. Now again, we have quite a full agenda today. Um, let me quickly go over them. So first, we're going to talk about promoting OER at your institution. Then we'll introduce the concept of OER state of the field report to get your feedback. And then we'll demo the open education professional directory, followed by updates on the consortium's open MOOC initiative. And then we'll talk about planning for the open education week 2015. And we'll have other general updates during which Marie Ann, um, Marie Ann will also give an update on her VNPAT um, product. And lastly, we'll open the floor for questions, comments, and discussion items from members, during which you can use your microphone to participate in the discussion, or you can use the chat window. You can enable your microphone by clicking on the microphone icon on the top menu bar. However, I'll keep all the microphones muted when someone is presenting. You can use the chat window then to type in your questions or comments when somebody's speaking. Okay, so for the first part, promoting OER at your institution, we have two guest speakers today, Glenda Cox from University of Cape Town and Professor Tal Ray Lee from National South University to talk about their efforts in promoting OER projects. Okay, Glenda, then it's all yours. Okay, hi everyone. Can everybody hear me clearly? Yes, great. That's wonderful. Okay, I will go ahead then um, and get through quite a short presentation, so I hope it's not too much of a whirlwind. So good morning all and uh, welcome from a blustery, rainy spring day in Cape Town. Um, OER and Open Access Initiatives at UCT are currently in, a, in an exciting transition. So in 2010, the Open Content Directory was launched and it has been sustained through steady hard work. It contained almost exclusively open, education, open educational resources. The open landscape at UCT is illustrated here in this rather complicated slide, which I won't get into in any detail. However, it shows that we, show, we started our agenda in 2007 and currently the library is becoming a key stakeholder and I'll talk a little bit about this at the end again. Last month, we launched our brand new institutional repository which now includes both research and teaching and learning materials and we're very excited about this new development. Our team, well, I am a member of the Center for Innovation in Learning and Teaching, or SILT, and I work with my colleagues Cheryl Hodgkinson-Williams and Thomas King. We all work on a part-time basis and draw support from our colleagues in a sort of ad hoc, ad hoc way. We have a very strong research interest um, and meet regularly about research into OER. We also have a, an open UCT team, which was funded externally by the Mellon Foundation. And that project ends in December. Uh, and they were responsible for launching the repository. Our director is Laura Chernowicz, and she is a champion of open and OER. So we have a multifaceted approach to creating awareness. And this slide is a, a list of just some of those practices that we use. And as I go through the next few slides, I'll elaborate a little bit more on some of these points. So for example, we support our champions. We have a paper, newspaper that goes out uh, for the university every month. 
We have regular open access and open education week events. We have a conference where we present. We use social media quite extensively. We run workshops. We have student projects. And we have OER growth grants. So you'll see we really do kind of do whatever we can to promote OER. So we began this whole process with our enthusiasts, with people who are already sharing um, in the most wonderful way and drew them into this process of sharing. So we had a, a very nice example of a guide that was created for first year students that has been used at UCT but also other universities in South Africa. We have a very nice little case study here of an open content resource that became a journal article. So that was really a nice initiative. And uh, Matuma Ramafakim, the academic involved, also received an open education um, award. We use our Monday monthly newspaper. Whenever we've got some news or something significant, we would like to report on it. And that goes out to our entire UCT um, community. Uh, as I mentioned, we have award winners. We have received three ACE awards from the Open Education Consortium. And the support of the Open Education Consortium has been phenomenal in this regard and has helped us to raise the profile of openness at UCT. Recently, Joan Klopper has received an Educator Award. We host several events that coincide with International Open Wing weeks. So for example, in 2011, Open Access Week, our Vice Chancellor signed the Berlin Open Access Declaration. We also do events in Open Education Week and we're looking forward to the one coming up next year. We use social media extensively. Here you will see a website that we have created that has regular blog posts, uh, tweets and also links to our Facebook site. Then it should be noted that a lot of our funding has come from external funders. In fact, the Open Content Directory and the Open UCT repository have been externally funded. However, we were very excited to receive a small amount in 2013 from our Vice Chancellor's Fund. The idea was to employ students to support lecturers in creating or preparing OER, and that project has been extended out, so we're very pleased with that. Um, here is an example of one of the resources that was created. We host a series of workshops um, suggesting why academics should contribute, and these workshops always include an introduction to Creative Commons. We also give out OER grants funded by the Mellon Foundation. These grants are worth around about $1,000. Academics use these to employ students or web design specialists to prepare their teaching materials for contribution as OER. These have been very successful and we still have funds for 10 more of these grants. The road ahead. So the road ahead for us is very exciting. We've made wonderful strides towards open access across the entire university. However, we now have new stakeholders in the library. So the new repository will be owned by the library and they will do all the day-to-day -day moderation. This means we need to do advocacy work now with the faculty librarians to engage them in OERs and to help them to believe in the importance of OERs as well as open access. So my role and my colleagues' role will, conti will continue to be around training, support, some advocacy, and then ongoing research into OER in the future. So we really don't know how this is going to pan out. We're not sure how the librarians are going to take it on. And we're really, we're in a particular phase of transition. So that was my brief presentation. I hope I kept to time. I wasn't timing it. But you'll see a link on this page to a book chapter. So if you're interested in reading more about open education and the open scholarship agenda at UCT, I've included this link to a pre-release book chapter. Thank you very much for listening.
Thank you very much, Glenda, for your presentation. It was really helpful and timing was perfect. Okay, so let us now invite Professor Lee. Uh, I'm Tao Wei Li, the director of Open Education Office in National uh, in the National Ta uh, Jiao Tong University. I'm going to talk about how we promote the experience of how we uh, promote uh, OCW. We start our OCW in 2007. First year we have only three class, uh, one calculus one physics and one chemistry. After eight years, now we have 171 courses, only 140, oh, 146 full video courses. But still calculus one, still the most popular class in the OCW. For students study those fundamental classes, they usually ask if we provide certificate exam to help them to judge their study result. So in the end of 2007, we give the certificate, certificate exam. And for those stu good students, uh, only probably 20% to 30% to get the certificate. But our university did not agree to give the credit for those certificate. Because for those good students, they still lack of the learning record. That's why we move to a stage two. Stage two, we incorporate with the Moodle system and we put all the video linkage in the uh, Moodle system and open the internet courses in our campus. During the semester or during the summer vacation, we uh, encourage professor to give those internet courses. Because those internet courses uh, provide the learning record. So university agree to give the credit and the normal credit to those internet courses. Uh, especially, uh, most of the internet courses still fundamental science. And last year, we moved to the flip classroom the former director, uh, Professor Pai, she used Calculus 1 and Calculus 2, the most popular uh, OCW course, and tried to start the flipped classroom. And the main purpose is student listen the OCW uh, video at home or in the dorm, and they do the problem solving in the classroom. They like that class very much. So we try to do the, some organized workshop to encourage our professor start to use OCW courseware to uh, give more flipped classroom this year. And uh, we also do some publicity. We put our video, probably once uh, two thirds of the video in the, uh, on the YouTube, which attract different level of the people. For example, the most popular class in NCTU OCW web is a class, uh, Calculus 1, but in the YouTube, actually is linguistic. So different level of the people use different, uh, use different video. And also we uh, put our uh, community on the Facebook, uh, try to organize a student and also uh, let the user to publish their user's story and help the people to understand how they can use uh, OCW courseware. And I will give you two examples in the last slides. Uh, this year, we start uh, to put the best courses in the uh, edX and try to use the open uh, MOOC and which will start a new, uh, a new way of use our OCW. And we will investigate how the usage, uh, how the usage in the open MOOC, and uh, we may be organize our new future of OCW. And every year we will 
a print DM and sent to the uh, older senior high school in Taiwan because those certificate certificate of uh, fundamental science classes will help uh, will help the good senior high school to get the entrance permission of the good university in Taiwan. So most of the students, uh, especially the best student of the uh, senior high school, will come to take exam. Also, uh, during the orientation uh, of NCTU uh, orientation week, we sent those freshmen a souvenir gift postcard or any uh, some survey and to help them to understand uh, NCTU provide a, a OCW will help help them to study during these four years. Uh, finally, I just give you the two example of the user story. One is a hearing impaired student. They she use our OCW class repeat again and again to overcome her study barrier. And finally, she get the permission of Graduate School of Applied Mathematics in our university. Another interesting story is a gr one grandma, almost 70 years old, start to learn calculus from our OCW by herself because in order to help her grandson to pass the calculus exam in the senior high school, also try to get a certificate uh, of the OCW. That's uh, why she studied the calculus. Uh, these are the experience of our OCW and I hope people can enjoy those uh, our experience. I'm happy to answer any question now. Yeah, that's my talk. Wow, okay. yeah, there are some great stories. Thank you Professor Lee for sharing your experiences. So I'll open the floor for some questions briefly on the two presentations. So Igor is asking Glenda, can you please explain a bit more about the transition to the under the library and why the library specifically? And Glenda has a question to Professor Lee. <laughs> Hi, Igor. I think it's okay, probably Glenda, you wanna... yeah. I think it's probably easier to just chat about it than to try and. Type, my typing's not that quick. Um, so I, traditionally in universities, re institutional repositories are managed by the library. And uh, this is why we feel that they should own the repository. We, as I sort of tried to mention, we're quite a small unit. So we don't have the capacity or the resources in our unit to continue managing the repository, which would also include all open access material, as well as other collections, as well as uh, student uh, theses. So it, it really is uh, should be the ownership of the library um, as opposed to us. So, so this is why the transition has, has happened to the library. And we think that this is a, a very good way ahead uh, to get the library involved in open access and open education. And I imagine that there are some other institutions around the world that have done this. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll learn through it. And uh, yeah, I agree to speak is easier to type in than type in. Uh, yes, uh, we get a good support from the top of our university. University, and uh, we op uh, we have an office and uh, a fixed uh, grant annually, and uh, but in the beginning, like 2007, 2008, uh, we have a 
effort to we struggle a lot to get a recognition from our university until the internet course uh, get recognition from all the senior professor and uh, they think OCW is quite important especially now so uh, in the beginning those senior professor they quite against OCW they think face-to-face -face class is uh, more important than the in uh, those OCW uh, courseware because OCW courseware may uh, may uh, pro may uh, distract the student to come to the classroom but now those senior professor they th they know because student they study in a different way but probably because the iPad or mobile phone a uh, student been uh, watch those things during the classroom and but if you provide a good OCW courseware student like those courseware and they, they come to classroom to discuss the problem they have they meet in the videotape so that's why our university quite uh, treat the OCW very significantly Professor Lee, there's another question from Igor about the certification option for your open courses. Uh, I'm not sure what is the advanced placement. Oh, uh, um, it, it's a program where high school students can take university level courses. They have AT system in the state. Oh, I see. In the United in the United States, uh, we have an uh, entrance exam. Yes, uh, we have two different systems for the entrance exam. Uh, during the winter vacation, we say uh, it's a uh, general uh, high school exam, and if you pass that exam. Uh, you have to do the application process like in United States you have an interview you have to provide a supplement to uh, uh, to uh, show you, you your ab 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 ability okay that's the first winter exam of the senior high st uh, student uh, but if you didn't get good record during that winter exam then you you can move to the summer entrance exam uh, which more rigorous and more difficult than the winter exam and it's like you pass this this exam then we ranking you and you should go to some university and then that you don't have much choice during the summer uh, entrance exam so most of the student uh, senior student in Taiwan they like to take winter exam then they have more choice of the university and they can show their ability to get some specific department is that your question okay thank you um i think we're going to have to take this conversation for another time because i'm really interested in seeing how high school students in taiwan are using open source there to approve of their ability to carry on at um, study in university. Igor asked whether you have numbers on how many certificates were issued and how many students gained entry to university based on such certificates. Uh. Do you have any more information? How many? Uh, actually, I don't have such a record because uh, I know some students try to get our uh, uh, entrance uh, permission, uh, the uh, permission of our entrance application. I saw those certificate. But we don't have a, such record how many students use certificate. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, they get a certificate. It, I, 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 we didn't follow up uh, those things. Yeah, I, sh I think we should do some uh, sur so survey. Okay, so let's take, wait for one more comment from Marion. Ah, uh, right. I do understand. Um, all right. So, right, there's, it, it's a combination of many things for Thomas and Um All right, so let's move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the OER State of the Field Report. Um, so, there are quite a few reports and surveys out there but we feel that the field is now ready for an overview of the progress of open education. So, for example, we need an overview of the numbers, such as numbers of projects, numbers of resources, number of languages the resources are offered in, etc. We would also need opinion statements from stakeholders, such as what do administrators or faculty think about OER, and what is the user experience in open education. So we, the consortium, is um, we're in a very good position to embark on such a project. However, in order to avoid duplication and whatnot, instead of creating our own brand new survey, we think it would be wise to kind of piggyback on other surveys. So we would add a couple of questions that we want to know to existing surveys, and then aggregate all the responses to create a comprehensive field report on open education. So the question, um, so um, we would like your feedback on this project. Um, we, what we would like to ask our community is, is this something that we should be doing? So, do you think this is needed for the field? And secondly, what reports and surveys are you aware of that have one or more questions on open education? And lastly, we're looking for people who will help us steer this project and the task would, would involve things like locating existing surveys, performing needs assessments, defining the scope of a report, and designing questions. So, if you have any feedback or comments now, um, you're more than welcome to give us your opinion now or we can wait till the end of the meeting so that you have a little time to think about it. Okay, Glenn. Um, hi, yes. I think that I know for certain Igor is aware of the Raw for D project that is coming out of uh, sort of being led by uh, Cheryl Hodgkinson Williams here at UCT. It's funded by the IDRC and and other funders, and it's a Global South project, and part of that project includes uh, surveys uh, in in South America in three countries in Africa, as well as uh, several countries in Southeast Asia. Uh, and I know that for a fact we would be interested in talking to the consortium around
around how we could work together um, and we'd be very happy to have a, a session where we can chat to you about you know, sharing our survey questions so you can have a look at those. So uh, we're very happy to work with you in this regard. Okay, that'd be great. Thanks. So I'm sure that others are thinking about all the institutions, organizations, and surveys that they know of. I think um, we'll wait for more comments later um, at the end of the meeting then. All right, so that takes us to the demo of the Open Education Professional Directory. So the directory began offering the service early this month, and this is what it looks like. You can browse through by field of expertise or region. Expertise, and to the right is browsing by region, or you can look up an individual. Now, of the four categories for expertise, you can go into more specific category, categories, and the whole time you see the green button that says add yourself. So if you have not added yourself, if you have not registered, yourself in this directory, please do so in the near future. We would love to have you on the directory. Now, we pulled up one individual, our own Igor Lesko. Let's see what the directory shows about Igor. So you see the general facts like institution, location, the contact point, languages he speaks, and areas of expertise. Now, I would like to ask you to help us improve the directory. So please use it and let us know how you use it and send us comments on its usefulness to you. And if you're contacted through your listing, please let us know the reason for contact. We don't have to know about all the specifics. We just have to know who's contacting for what reason. So was it for consultancy? Was it for collaborative project? That's the kind of feedback we'd love to get from you. And also other general feedback and suggestions. They can all be directed to directory at odconsortium.org. Any questions on the directory? Have you all used it? Thank you, Marianne. <laughs> okay, that's great. Thank you. Oh, you're adding yourself now. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, it would be great to see everybody here. That's just a great resource for everybody to have. Yes, of course. Well, thank you. All right, then let's move on to the next, again, next item on the agenda, which is the Open MOOC update.
Okay, so you saw this screen from Professor Lee's um, presentation. We now have three courses open for registration under the umbrella of OECX. There's a course from National Towson University, University of Cape Town, and Tufts University. And we do think that this is a great benefit to all our member institutions and their key points for participation. Now, the institution has to be a member of the OEC, and the MOOC must be built from existing open content. But of course, it can be enhanced to become more MOOC friendly. There's no call for members to participate, so resources need to be allocated to develop and facilitate the MOOC. Now, um, some of you may have seen this during the June meeting. There are some options for OECX MOOCs. Now, MOOCs can be offered in any language um, if you're doing an OECX, and the length can range from two weeks to 15 weeks, um, although we do encourage shorter ones. The MOOCs can be facilitated or self-paced, and you can work out details to offer certificates with edX. A series can be offered from one institution or between institutions. And we would love to see more creativity with pedagogy, um, whether it be in remixing content or team teaching or co-offering or sequencing options. So we would love to encourage everyone to participate in this, in our open loop project and just add a little bit of creativity to learn teaching and learning practices. So we're able to offer more courses to start any time in 2015 now. If you're interested in offering an open MOOC for OECX, please contact any staff member. We'll have webinars on designing MOOCs with OER in early 2015. So, do you have any questions about the Open MOOC initiative? We have Willem in the meeting room right now, who's been extremely helpful with the Open MOOC project, and he's also um, an expert in designing MOOCs. So if you have any questions, we can talk about it at the, towards the end of the meeting today. Or you can just choose the questions right now. We'll wait for Professor Lee's question before we move on to the next item.
will there be more open loops meets from OECX? Um, are you talking about more in more discipline? Because you are you participated in the pilot project where the disciplines were kind of limited. Right, right. So we'll be accepting, we'll be, um, we plan to host more courses in all sorts of disciplines. There is not going to be a limit on what courses we can offer. Great, thank you. Okay, then let's move on to the next item on the agenda. which is Open Education Week 2015. So we now have a landing page at openeducationweek.org. Please do download materials from here to put them on your institutional website or even your personal blog and help us promote the event. Um, it's from March 9th to the 13th next year and we'll have a call for participation in the planning committee very soon as well you'll hear from us again but for now it would be great if we can just keep spreading the word with the material from this website and we have a couple more updates on general consortium stuff or the things that we're doing. But before we start with that, I would like to invite Mary Ann to give an update on her VMPAC project. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me well. Yes. OK. <laughs> Perfect. So I'm Marianne from uh, the International University of La Rioja, UNIT, based in Spain. I'm really glad to be part of uh, this meeting today. And uh, well, I'm going to present to you briefly um, the VMPACT project, um, which is uh, uh, which started in October uh, 7 and 13, so one year ago, and um, and so you near uh, participating in this project. So the aim of uh, the empath, uh, as you can see in the in the title, is to increase uh, the interinstitutional uh, recognition of virtual mobility and open education-based courses. Um, we believe that uh, increasing uh, quantity and quality of recognition processes in, in these areas we will uh, create new flexible learning pathways for students uh, inside higher education uh, will allow institutions to increase uh, the scope of their offer by integrating teaching and learning done at other institutions in their curricula. Also, uh, we want to improve uh, resource efficiency within uh, higher education institutions and hopefully we will lead, it will lead to um, an increase uh, in the use and impact of uh, OERs. To achieve these aims, um, we will build uh, on the results of the OER test initiative, which is a previous uh, project on which uh, is based uh, on which uh, VMPath is based. Um, so by piloting uh, within a living lab the use of a student-held uh, learning passport, so to facilitate uh, recognition and uh, mobility. We'll plan, uh, test, and create a recognition clearinghouse 
uh, to support the verification and investigation of uh, learning passports. Uh, we'll create a typology of quality systems used um, on, VM, uh, on virtual mobility and OER systems, so to support the learning passports and recognition clearinghouse. And finally, uh, engage in dialogue with multiple institutions around Europe so, um, so we can mainstream the use of the recognition tools uh, created uh, by the project. So according to our plan, uh, institution will use uh, the recognition clearinghouse in uh, the following way. So students uh, ask for recognition of uh, learning from virtual mobility or OER learning experience. The recognition office in the institution uh, checks the student record and the clearinghouse. If the course is already in the clearinghouse, the recognition office can use it, use this data to uh, compare and make a decision on recognition. And uh, if the course uh, is not uh, in the clearinghouse, the recognition office uh, verifies uh, credentials of the institution and also the content and quality of the course as well as the forms of assessment and then uh, we'll make the decision on the recognition and all of this data will be integrated in the clearinghouse so to help other institutions uh, with the recognition decisions so UNIR, um, our university as partner of uh, the project and 100% uh, uh, online university had the, the opportunity to test the learning passport uh, to support uh, a new approach uh, at our university. Um, it consists in recognizing a MOOC as part of a specific uh, subject of an official uh, master degree at UNIR. So this way, uh, students uh, will have uh, the option to take this MOOC and uh, get uh, a number of ECTS uh, when achieving it. A number of higher education institutions uh, that we contacted within the project will do the same and try the learning uh, passport within uh, a living lab, uh, which will be launched at the end of this month. So here are uh, the different partners of uh, the project, uh, all uh, European uh, partners. And um, for further information, you can take a look at the website uh, or contact us uh, through the, the project email. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much for the wonderful update on the project. Does anybody have a question on VMPAC? So it would be really interesting to see how um, open courseware from Taiwan can be um, can have more weight on their certificates, and it would be great to see how the impact of the learning pathways can have more OERs turning into um, credentials or accredited courses. And we can, we'll continue to talk more on that. All right. OK, so um, I don't know if you've seen this through um, social media or in the email, but the Open Education Global Conference 2015 from eight, um, April 22nd to 24th in the beautiful town of Banff, Alberta, Canada. So the conference website is now up at conference.oveconsortium.org. Call for papers open now and submission deadline is the 30th of November. So I, rec I suggest that you all make plans to submit very soon.
And now um, we have an agreement with EdCat, which is another MOOC platform. I'm going to ask Mary Lou to elaborate a little more on this. Mary Lou, would that be okay? Yes. Uh, hi, everybody. I, I'll talk quickly because I realize we're running out of time. Um, so EdCast is a provider um, that will host MOOCs. So it's a MOOC hosting service. They actually have a version of Open edX to which they've added a number of um, interesting features, including several very good mobile features for mobile phones. Um, and they uh, are interested in having um, more MOOCs being hosted um, on their Open edX instance. They will provide full uh, technical support and full support for helping to author this. Um, it is, they will normally charge $5,000 US to host a MOOC. Um, it gives you full control over everything you want to do with your MOOC, including if you wanted to offer certificates or paid tutoring or some other type of um, paid service. All of those revenues would come back to you. With our agreement, uh, the cost is reduced for Open Education Consortium members. It would be $3,750 instead of $5,000 for hosting. So if you are interested in exploring the option of having uh, a hosted MOOC service that allows you a lot more customization than uh, other options currently do. This is uh, something that we've entered into, and all you need to do when you talk with them is let them know you're an OEC member and you'll get the discount. Okay, great. So I guess the more options, the better. All right. Um, Okay, so the last thing we wanted to update you on was the committees. Um, if you could please go to this URL and go through the list of committees. So in June, we promised you that we would have the charges for each committee and um, and have all the committees formed somewhat. And we, for the most of the committees that you see on the list, we now have the chair, the board liaison, the staff person in charge of um, supporting the committee, etc. If you signed up in June, you will hear from us again on how you can participate and for calls um, for individual committees. Now, do you have any questions on any of the updates? Well, all right. Um, we only have a couple minutes to the hour that was promised to us, but if you have any questions or comments on any of the topics that were covered today, this is your chance. Okay, the open call to host OE Global 2016 is also if you are interested in having your institution host our global conference, do go to the wrong button you look for the URL. <laughs> Linda, poke, poke. <laughs>
So, okay. All right, so do check out the URL and see if your institution would be interested in hosting. Any other comments, questions? Okay, then we'll finish here. We will have the recordings ready, available for you so that you can um, listen to the presenters again. We'll also email you on where you can access the, the slides, videos, and about certain questions that were raised um, during the meeting today. Thank you all for joining us today. And